Some reactions from the president's aide on the Chicago State University releases on President Tinubu's records after the depositions in the U.S. pursuant to Atiku Abubakar's request. And the Minister of Interior, who promised to clear over 200,000 backlog of passports, will be speaking to us tonight will be asking the question, has he been able to fulfill that promise he made on this program a few weeks ago? Hello, everyone. Welcome to the program. This is Politics Today, live on China Television. I'm Sean Wakimalo in Abuja. Well, actions and reactions have continued to trail the legal pursuit of Mr. Atiku Abubakar, a former vice president and the PDP presidential candidate seeking to make public the academic records of President Tunubu. The Chicago State University CSU released the academic records of President Bola Tunubu to his political opponent, Atiku Abubakar, in line with an order of a United States court. Yesterday, the positions were made on some of the details given as officials, and some of those involved on the oath spoke on what they know. Meanwhile, a presidential aide, a media aide, Tokwe Ajayi, went on the social media platform X. He said, uh, quote, we should be clear, in the deposition made by the Chicago State University, where there was nowhere the university said the certificate presented to INEC by President Tinubu is fake. The university insisted on the oath that President Tunubu graduated with honors and even at that replacement for lost certificates are done by vendors, not the university. The claim that President Tunubu submitted fake certificate to INEC does not make sense. Man cannot forge the academic records he possesses. You can only forge what you don't have. And of course, that is what he put on his social media handle X. Atiku Abubakar, the presidential candidate of the PDP, in the 25th February election, and I requested a document to back his allegation of forgery of a CSU certificate against Mr. Tinubu. The allegations of forgery was one of those dismissed by Nigeria's presidential election court in the suit Atiku filed to challenge the election of Mr. Tinubu. We understand that lawyers to Mr. Atiku Abubakar might be using the outcome of the depositions in the United States state and what the Chicago State University have released in court as they gone on appeal on the judgment of the presidential election tribunal. Well, let's tell you that the Senate has confirmed three ministerial nominees, Jamila Ibrahim from Kwara State, Balabe Lawa, Kaduna State, and Ayodele Olawande from Undo State, in addition to the 45 approved by the Red Chamber in August this year. This comes a day after President Bala Tinubu wrote to the Senate seeking is the confirmation of the nominees. Let me allow you to listen to some of the nominees as they address uh, the Senate uh, seeking nomin uh, their, their confirmation of their nomination. This is my mission and my pledge to you. I will work so that Nigerian youth will have opportunities to educate themselves, to develop themselves, and exploit their potential talents through acquiring entrepreneurship and leadership skills. I know that it is possible because I am not alone, and um, I am aware that I am fully cognizant of the gravity of responsibilities associated with this position, and I stand ready to discharge them with unwavering dedication, transparency, and accountability. If confirmed by this esteemed and most respected Senate, along with my, uh, by this esteemed and most respected Senate, I aspire to bring this wealth of experience and expertise to bear on my new role, further contributing to the actualization of the renewed hope vision of Mr. President as it strongly concerns young people. As a Nigerian youth, sir, and ma'am, Womb's story is common with the story of the Nigerian youth out there. Permit me, sir, and ma'am, to please in your honor to take me as your son into this uncommon family. I will work with my other minister
to make sure that the youth constituency is being carried along and change the narrative of the youth and the government, to bring them together, to show love, and to engage them. To leading the change in addressing these challenges of environmental issues. My vision for the ministry rests on three fundamental pillars, conservation, resilience, and collaboration with most uh, collaboration. We must prioritize protection and preservation of our previous natural resources, strengthen our environmental regulation, and foster a sense of stewardship among our communities, build new resilience in climate change, in, 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 is, for, is, paramount, is paramount, and we are all we, are, we will all develop robust adaptation and mitigation strategies to promote renewable energy in our in our in our country. Those are some of the summations of uh, the nominees there. Well, some uh, not very pleasant uh, situation happened earlier. A minister, minister and nominee, Balarabe Lawal uh, Abbas slumped while being screened by the Senate and uh, sparking some frantic scenes in the chamber. The nominee, who is from Kaduna State, has spoken for several minutes during his uh, screening before falling to the floor and several lawmakers rushing to his aid. Uh, he's one of the three new ministerial nominees being screened by the Senate, with others being Dr. Jamila Bio Ibrahim from Kwara and Ayodele Olawande from Undo State. He had finished making his presentations to the lawmakers and the senator representing Kaduna South. Sunday Marshall was the one who was speaking and saying that the three senators from Kaduna had no objection to Lawa's nomination when the nominee fell to the floor. The Senate went into a closed-door session and one we could hear the Senate president asking cameramen to switch off their cameras and called for a closed session, calling also medical doctor to come to the aid. But uh, you remember a few weeks ago, I mean, it went viral when the Minister of Interior, after his uh, visit to the um, immigration service, and he had said to them that he has no... Uh, any kind of patience for any lagging or any kind of delay in the, the uh, issuance of uh, international passport to Nigerians. And he did say then that it was not uh, uh, an idea of um, pre, uh, it was, it's a right for citizens, not a privilege. And he did say on this program that the over 200,000 of those passports that are still with the, uh, with the, passport office will be cleared. And we asked him, how soon? And he gave us a timeline. He said within about two weeks. Now he's back on the program tonight. We'll be asking the question, how much of those have been done? Before we get talking with him, let's check out some of your political random stories. The Chief Justice of Nigeria, Justice Olukayode Ariwola, has asked judges in the country to always apply constitutional provisions. Justice Ariwola says despite the attacks on the judiciary and the public opinion, no matter how serious, cannot override or supersede the constitution of the country. The CJN was speaking in Abuja at the swearing-in of 23 new judges of the Federal High Court. The National Judicial Council should never, either by omission or commission, be mistaken for a toothless bulldog. It can bark fiercely and as well bite deeply and aggressively too. The governor of Adamawa State, Umar Fintiri, has described the outcome of the election petition tribunal verdict as a victory for democracy. Governor Fintiri stated this while interacting with journalists at the Lamido Ali Mustafa International Airport. The governor thanked the people of the state for giving him their mandate for another four years. The only assurance we'll give is that uh, there is no winner, no vanquish. Adama project is first and will continue to ensure that we deliver the dividends of democracy to make our people happy. And ahead of the November 11, 2023 governorship election in Kogi State, the African Democratic Congress has inaugurated the Leke Abejide Campaign Council with a mandate to work towards the victory of the party in the election. At the inauguration ceremony in Lokoja, the Kogi State capital, the national chairman of the party, Mr. Ralph Mosu, says the people of Kogi State deserve to enjoy the dividends of democracy under a new administration. 
The Abia State Governor, Dr. Alex Oti, has called on the President, the Chief of Army Staff, the National Security Advisor, and the Inspector General of Police to kindly use their good offices to cause immediate and thorough investigation into the allegations that his four month old government is sponsoring the indigenous people of Biafra IPOB to cause terror in the state. At a news conference at the government house in Umuahia, Governor Oti, who was represented by his special advisor on media and publicity, Ferdinand Ekioma, said the young men who organize the press conferences should be invited by security agencies to come and throw more light on the allegations to enable law enforcement agencies to carry out thorough investigations that could lead to the arrest of culprits. All right, and thank you so much, everyone, for staying with us tonight. The Minister of Interior, Honorable Olubumi Tunjojo, is our guest. You remember, a few weeks ago on this program, he made a promise. Let me remind you of what he said. Instruction that I've given to the Immigration Service. I do not see anything in the short term. I don't think clearing out backlogs, it shouldn't take more than two weeks. By the grace of God, we give them all the assurance of His Excellency the President that we will unbottle our bottlenecks, that's number one. And number two, we will unbottle these bottlenecks without jeopardizing or sacrificing national security. You can be rest assured of that. We're coming up with our work plan, and we're going to come up with KPIs, key performance indicators, and we're going to have our timelines, and we're going to, do, we're going to carry the civil society and, um, of course, the media along. We want Nigerians to be able to judge us, by virtue, Nigerians should be able to to mark our scorecard. We should be able to give us a scorecard after every quarter. This is what we, what we aim to achieve under the leadership of the president. All right, then, Honorable Olubu Mitsuri Ojo, the Honorable Minister for Interior, is live with us on the program. Thank you so much, Honorable Minister, for joining us tonight. Thank you. So me. you made that promise. You said it should not take you more than two weeks. That was a promise you made right there on that same chair. Have you done that? Well. Um, Good evening, Nigerians. Let me, uh, first of all, uh, thank God Almighty for the opportunity of, of, um, and the privilege of life. We made a promise and um, that was going to take us two weeks. But let me start by apologizing to Nigerians that it took three weeks <laughs> instead of two weeks. We had a backlog of about 204,332. That's the number of people that had enrolled without their passports being printed. But uh, three weeks after, by first, that was on the 7th of September, uh, we made a promise, uh, the 6th or 7th of September. But by the 1st of October, we had cleared all the 204,332. As I speak to you, there is no backlog that has not been printed. What we are on now is advocacy for collection, for people to go and uh, pick up their passports. And of course, if yesterday I gave a machine order to the immigration service to, um, to send messages, even follow up with calls to, to Nigerians, and, uh, and also do press releases to tell Nigerians to go to the passport offices and collect their passports. So far as of today, uh, the number of uh, backlog already cleared, as I said, is 204,332. The number that uh, the number of passports that um, have been collected is 94,981. Those one, the ones that have not yet become collected, but they are ready for collection at various passport offices is about 109,351. Um, uh, so that's the number. So as we speak to you, every Nigerian, any Nigerian should be able to go to the passport offices where they enrolled and pick up their passport. Congratulations, I must say, because perhaps for the first time in a long time in Nigeria, we have public officers who say we will do this, and they have done it. And I must say congratulations to you. Albeit you apologize that it took three weeks rather than the two weeks, uh, which a lot of people thought that it can never happen. It could have made, maybe it was going to be difficult for you to make that happen. But now, give us an understanding of how... What you are doing, because there are those who have complained also that the collection is also very tedious. And they have to use touts 
uh, those who are on the outside of the passport collection centers uh, to get their passport collected, paying extra and more money than they naturally should pay in getting their passports. Okay, thank you, Sheon. Let me say this very clearly. I have to appreciate the president, President Bola Ahmed Tinubu, who has given us all the support needed to solve this problem. He has actually given us all the support and he's been on our neck to say, hey, I appointed you to bring results, not to bring excuses. So a lot of this um, uh, achievement would have been impossible without um, the support that we got from him, you know. I want to respond to what you've said. It's a systemic issue. Um, on this issue of password, I have also, I addressed a press conference earlier today, and I said it very clearly. Nigerians should please, do not, do not, do not give money to anybody. Initially, they had issues with the activation of the passport, you know, process, which, of course, Touts and people try to take advantage of that. But as of today, I can tell you that that's fully sorted today. So there's no need to give money to any tout. So and if you walk into the passport office, yes, give and take, in 30 minutes, you should be able to go in and out and collect your no, passport. No, you should get your passport after sorting. Of course, there are so many passports. For instance, Ikeja had 30, Alausa had 37,000, over 37,900 uh, passports. Printed already. Printed already. Uncollected. Unco no. That was the back that, that, From the 204,000. Exact, exactly. So out of the, yeah, from the 204,000. Yes, yeah. they had 37, yeah, Kenya had 37,900 plus. Today, 9,000 plus being collected. So we still have um, about uh, 28,000 that has not been collected. Imagine 20,000 people going to the uh, passport office at the same time. You know, it might be a bit chaotic and stuff like that. And that is why part of the reforms, that leads me to part of the reforms we are bringing into passport administration. For me personally, and I have to say this to the service providers, I said it today, I said it yesterday, and I've always told them, you need to make life easy for people. You cannot, we cannot as a government, we cannot as a service, make things more difficult than they ought to be. And part of the reforms that we're putting in place now, starting from December, is that even when you want to enroll for your passport, you fill your forms online, you do your payment online and everything. You do not need to go to passport office to have your picture captured. No. People apply for American visa. People apply for UK visa. People apply all over the world. And your passports with required specification as directed by NIS will be uploaded on the platform. So you upload your passports online, you upload your supporting documents online. So when you go to immigration office, you spend just like five minutes just to have your biometric caption. That's all. So the era of people sacrificing a whole day just because they want to go to a passport office for enrollment is over. It is unacceptable. It, as I said, you cannot inconvenience people based on their rights. It is the right of people to have a seamless experience. Is it the right of people to have a sweet experience? Is it the right of people to have a renewed hope experience, an experience that is laden with renewed hope, such that you go there, you capture just your fingerprint, your biometric, and it is done. What that does for us is that today, an average passport office captures just like 400 people a day. Because by the time immigration will look at the officials, will look at your document, they, you bring the hard copy, they will still take your passport picture. And all. But if we um, automate all this process, and, and all we do is just the biometric, which of course we need to do, because as much as we must not also sacrifice competence on the altar of speed, we must not sacrifice the integrity of the process. We need to be sure that the person that is coming for the passport is who he says he is by virtue of biometric features. So we will continue to get that, enroll them biometric, uh, in terms of the biometric feature. But once that is done, you just go there, you take your biometric feature, you go. So it, hold on, Shane. What After that, to me, I see no reason why people should go back to immigration office to go and be queuing to collect their passport. There should be what we call a value-added service. It's a value-added service. It's there when you go to, um, when you apply for visas. It is there even in Europe. It's there in America. Nobody goes to immigration office in America. Nobody goes to immigration office in the UK. So once you apply, 
and you pay, you should be able to have the option. So do you want home delivery or delivery to your office? That's the point so, I yes. was going to ask you, Honorable yeah. Minister. Nipost is almost more, I mean, is almost non-existent in the minds of many Nigerians. And even the United States, as large, as large and as big as that country is, they make use of uh, the postal services. Yeah. Uh, and I'm wondering, the place of these in delivering this sort of service to Nigerians, I mean, if this kind of, for example, even in the banks in the United States, they will put your, your ATM cards in the mail for you and it gets delivered to you and you will get it. So... Are you thinking of this kind of service? That's and, exactly and, and to to the point that it will not be too ex so expensive to Nigeria because you can't say that you will not pay. You will pay for the postal service because it comes to your doorstep. But then, in what way and what modality is that going to take? Number one, let me tell you this: we've I've thought through this with my team, and we have said I I keep saying this: the essence of us being in government is to provide what we call a sweet experience, the renewed hope experience. That I know, I'm passionate about this because I know how passionate the president, His Excellency, is about it. And what we want to do is the only time you go to immigration office is when you go and capture your biometric. We should not take you more than five, ten minutes because you should be on appointment and there should be a queuing management system in place at, at those passport offices. These are not things that we will not do. When we promised that this government will we will get the 204,000 passports off, backlog off, in two weeks. People thought, oh, it's not going to be possible. But they've forgotten. This is a Bola Ahmed Tinubu government, a government that is focused on performance. So for this, I can assure you the price, because we are working through it, and we have, we're, we're trying to do all these, all the processes between now and December, so that by January, there is a, there is a new uh, workflow. There's a new process flow. What would it look like? What would that flow look like from beginning to the end? Okay, the beginning. Will it look like the American visa application process where you sit down in your home, apply online, upload everything that is necessary, and at the end of the day, you get whatever you need to get posted into your mail? Is that how it's likely to be? Well, I will not say it will be like the American system because every country is peculiar. Challenges are peculiar and terrains are peculiar and there are so many peculiarities. The you can use that but kind of system yeah, yeah, for the that process. We have to yeah. design a method that works for us as a people, a system that will automatically be able to solve our problems, you know, why not jeopardizing national security or our collective interests as a people? So... I would put you through the workflow. The workflow is you apply online, you do your payment, you do everything online, your passport picture, you upload it online based on the specification. I repeat that, based on specification, because we have to be sure of the clarity in order to avoid identity theft and what other issues. So there are specifications. So you upload this, your supporting document, you upload your attestation which you take to the court, sign, and whatever, that the information you are supplying, updated, you know, that they're real, they're genuine, you upload online, then you'll be able to pick a date to go to the passport office just for the purpose of biometrics. Once you're done with biometrics, then you will have the option. Maybe you want to do a personal pickup or you want to do um, home mail drop, uh, mail yeah. drop uh, either in the office or home or whatever. What that does for me, what another advantage of that is that it gives me a trail, what we call audit trail. It tells me that, oh, this is your address. That's where you actually live. If I'm oh, unable what? to, if I'm, I'm mailing to you and I cannot get your address, of course we'll return it back. Then when you come and pick, will not tell us why that address is not. So it also brings a bit of integrity into the address verification system, you know, that the NIS has. So with this, it means that the only time you have an encounter with an NIS staff, with an immigration staff, might not be more than five, 10 minutes. So the error of people carrying children, living from one uh, place to the other, booking hotels and doing all these things just for the purpose of enrollment, I guarantee you, under the Bola Ahmed Tinubu presidency, that era is over. Also, what we are also trying to do, because of our diaspora population, and also in some areas, we're also looking at having what we call more passport front offices. Because for me, 
I do not see. Yes, that has to be in partnership with some private sector. I mean, because funny enough, these things I'm talking about were things that had been conceived as far back as 2006 in the contract agreements, 2006, 2008 contract agreement. We saw some of these things, but most of these things were not activated. But coming on board, the first thing I did was to study all the existing contracts and be able to hold service providers responsible for what they're supposed to do. If you have a contract to provide A, and you're not providing A to the satisfaction of Nigerians, then of course, you have failed in performance. And when you fail in performance, we also reserve the right of termination of contract. Nobody, and I repeat, nobody, and I repeat, nobody will hold this country down because the interest of Nigeria is more important than individual interest or any business interest of any individual. So what we are guaranteeing Nigeria, Nigerians, sweet experience. We're giving them a renewed hope experience and what I love to call the Bola Ahmed Tinubu experience in the area of immigration service. Let me ask you, um, so we look at it, uh, uh, because we're still talking about immigration service. So there are a lot of people who are asking about the diasporans and how they, 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 maybe you need to look at the clusters. How many Nigerians are in the Americas? How many Nigerians are in Europe and the UK? And how you can be able, because a lot of them, if you go to Atlanta, for example, that center is usually uh, a, 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 a crazy heaven when you go for passport uh, 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 application. I, I mean, sometimes when you go to New York or DC also in Maryland area, when you want to apply for passport is usually hectic. In the UK, same thing in London, it's always very hectic. There was a time there was a protest on, at the, uh, the embassy with all of these issues. What specific hope should Nigerians who are living out of this country have, especially for those of them who are now having their passport, their expired passport right now, do they have any hope that there will be ease of collection of e or issuance or application? Well, let me say this, <clears throat> and I'm sorry to keep mentioning the renewed hope, but I'm not also sorry because this is what we're giving to Nigerians. The renewed hope is not about vague promises. The renewed hope is about practical promises with practical steps, empirical, verifiable, not just based on hypothesis. I will tell you what we're doing, we're, what we're doing and what we will do. We're not here to tell you tales that, does not, tales that do not exist. For the diaspora, the US is still better. But think about Canada. Canada is arguably the biggest country on earth in terms of landmass. Canada has only one passport office. What that tells you is that from an extreme end of Canada, you have to fly with your entire family if you have children, young children, whatever, just because you need a Nigerian passport. That is unacceptable. The problem we have outside Nigeria is not just a problem of backlog, maybe with exception to UK, the, uh, London, that has about 3,000. The main problem we have is one, appointments. Three, there is, because there are no appointment times, because there is a bit of congestion. So uh, what happens is uh, law of demand and supply. You see people now bribing, paying to have space and whatever. How do we solve that? It's by creating more passport offices, taking these offices closer to the people. So what we are looking at, for example, in Canada, for a start, we should have about three, four offices. These are not a yes, the government might be a bit, okay, we might not at this particular point in time be able to say, okay, we want to spend money to open all these things. But we can partner with the private sector, which incidentally, it's part of, I mean, incidentally, that service, the passport front office, is actually in the contract signed by NIS with some service providers over a time ago. But up till now, not yet activated. And I have told them, by January 1, God bless you, if you do not activate this, uh, these services, if you do not activate it, it means you lack the capacity to implement your contract. And you will not hold millions of Nigerians in diaspora to ransom by not being able to provide them a service you ought to provide. Right, Minister, uh, we're due for a break. But when we return, since we're talking about immigration service, this is just one of the agencies under your purview. Um, and I'm wondering, Plus, how difficult are we to, don't 
create a new thing. Just copy what you see elsewhere. We travel across the world, and when you come to Nigeria, what you have is not a story that is palatable at all when it comes to security clearance and oaths of others. I will be asking you about immigration service as we see it in Dubai, as we see it in the US, as we see it in the UK. Why do we return to Nigeria? The case is sometimes barbaric. The Honorable Minister of Interior is still with us. I'll be right back on the program with some of these conversations that pertain to you as the Nigerian people. We'll be right back, everyone. Rowan, uh, it's the Politics Today live on Channel Television. Minister of Interior, Olubomi Tugyojo, has been talking to us. And there uh, seems to be uh, a very long list of conversations that we need to have, speaking about the passport uh, backlog, and uh, then, of course, the regime, a new regime in releasing or issuing this passport. But let me take you to that issue that I mentioned. You go to other countries, and you see just one official that will take your passport, and you go. In Nigeria, when you return, almost 15 officials will collect your passport. Even NDLEA officials will collect your passports. They will never look at anything. That they will just collect your passport and look at it and give you back. And I'm wondering, for what purpose? Why does it look ridiculous that our system is like that? Why are we not able to do what now looks like a standard practice in some parts of the world? Well, Shem, I want to assure you, um, we're working, there's uh, inter-agency and inter-ministerial collaborations going on. I mean, there's a lot of that is going on. The interior, NDLA is under justice, Ministry of Justice. We have um, um, trade and investment people and a um, couple of other um, and aviation. agencies, you know, like customs, aviation. So there's a lot. Customs is under finance. Mm. Um, NDLA is under justice. Uh, of course, aviation is there. And um, so there's a lot of collaboration going on. And I want to assure you, uh, we are not in the game of making promises. I love, I hate to make promises that we cannot keep, you know. Um, we will come up with a holistic plan, you know, a work plan to revamp the whole process and make it seamless. Part of what we are trying to do at the level of immigration is to introduce what we call the e-gate pass. You know, like a smart gate, like what you see in Dubai. You see, once you are a Nigerian and you are coming to Nigeria, there's no point standing on the queue, going through all this pain. We want to, at our international airports, we should be able to have the Nigerian passport, scan your passport, it enters into the system. You go because you are a Nigerian, you know, so that should be a privilege. You can't go to Heathrow as a Nigerian and be on the queue forever and come to Nigeria, your own country, and be on the queue forever. When you see an EU citizen go to any of these EU countries, they're, spe they're specific, oh, you just go. When you see Dubai people, they have smart gates. And part of what we're also trying to do is to be able to introduce um, an ICAO certified um, ID, you know, which has ID card. Ghana has it already. I think Dubai has it and some other countries, they already have it. So in place of your international passport, in case of your ID card, your national ID card, should serve more than the purpose of just identification. It should also be your travel document. Right. So before I go there, Minister, yeah. so I imagine that, because I am trying to come back to say, I wonder what Nigerian leaders, when they travel, what they see. And I'm wondering whether I'm perhaps too paranoid when I go out of the country and I see things. And I'm wondering, why are these things not, why are we not able to replicate some of these things? They are basics. And if you look at what happened in the United States in the 9-11, the Homeland uh, Department, Homeland Security Department, was created in that country as a brainchild of what America faced uh, a terrorist attack on their soil and made them to rejig their security and uh, uh, ingress and, uh, uh, into their country and how people come into their country. And in fact, if you're going from one uh, American state to another by the airport, there are ways by which they check you. And I'm wondering, why is it difficult for us to do this kind of situation and this kind of uh, system? And you see it quickly, Jammy took it up France took it up, Dubai even expanded on it and made it so sophisticated. You, in fact, we may not be able to see anything. You just go through it, and only one person, perhaps, one immigration official is what you will see. 
Immigration has the burden to be able to admit people into this country, isn't it? Yeah. Why are they not solely taking that responsibility? No, they are. I mean, they are. They are not sharing their responsibility with anybody. It's, I mean, it's... Uh, it's, uh, it's uh, Minister, it's, I can uh, mention five other agencies that we see no, at, that the, you, that at the borders you, when you get into the international that you, that airport. That you see them at the borders does not mean they are responsible for admittance. But they the check country. you, and you, are, you no, get confused no, that, on their duty, exactly. As much as I don't want, I'm not the spokesman of these agencies, but when you talk about admittance into the country, that sole right belongs to immigration. Border control is the explicit right of Nigerian immigration service. It's immigration service. And they are not sharing that with anybody. We have to give kudos to our hardworking, some of our hardworking officials. You see, a lot of these things you're talking about, just don't forget, President Bola Ahmed Tinubu's administration is just how many months old. We do not expect magic. A lot is being done. For instance, we inherited these backlogs that we've cleared. I just told you about the smart kit now that we're trying to put that will give comfort to Nigerians. And also, one other thing I haven't said that, we are also, that was actually in the contract of some of these service providers, that they ought to have done, is what we call the Advanced Passenger Information System, APIS. You've spoken about security. You've used the U.S., the homeland, as an, as an example. There is no country today that it's what it's all, that do not, both, I mean, in terms of mig mig migration, that do not have what we call the APIS. We do not have that yet in Nigeria. But I want to tell you that by February, by the grace of God, APIS will be running in Nigeria. What that does for me, because immediately I came in, I was like, okay, why, how do you know that somebody who comes to Nigeria is who he says he is? That's number one. Then number two, how do you take decision on somebody coming within five seconds or 10 seconds that he spends in front of you in the counter? You should, what other countries have done is immediately you buy your ticket, immediately you're coming, the whole list, Niger the immigration service, we have access to it that this person is coming. So there can be pre-profiling. We can look at it and be able to assess threats, at, assess people, do further investigation. So that when you come, that's what happens in Dubai. When you get to Dubai and you, and you see some people arrive, or in Heathrow, and they just say, oh yeah, please, can you come to this side or something? It's not magic. It's not that. It's not rocket science. It's because they, have, they I mean, they have the information, the information that you are coming. So they've done, okay, these are the people that are coming. We'll do our due diligence. So we can be sure that whoever comes to Nigeria should actually be who in they Nigeria. They are. Exactly who they are. And they should, they actually have a reason to be here. So this was something that had been in, funny enough, in when I was going through the contracts in the ministry, when I came on board, this has been there for like, okay, border control management has been there for more than 10 years, but never activated. But immediately we called the contract though, this service provider, and I said, listen, don't tell me you have, a, you have a contract. No, your contract to the extent that it does not abuse the interest of Nigeria is valid. But if it affects negatively the interest of Nigeria and Nigeria's, it's null and void because national interest supersedes individual interest. And I told the country, yeah. and I told him, this particular solution, when is it coming on board? And at the end of the day, with immigration, I met them with immigration service, with uh, the ministry, with joint services, everybody. He said, okay, this does not come up by the third time of February, giving me a safer border and enhancing the capacity of our officers, Nigerian immigration service, helping their decision-making process and securing this country from external danger and securing my border and ensuring the safety of Nigerians, this contract will be terminated in public interest. So Nigerians, you are hearing the minister, you're listening to him, all your cameras, we need to see a change service from February. That's what we are hearing. And that is what we are hoping We have will already happen. started seeing a change service. I'll give you an example. I flew into um, the airport on Sunday from Italy. I carried my bag. I went to visa on arrival. Without, I needed to tell them, I was there. And I saw the way the officers treated some foreigners. And immediately, I summoned them for a meeting on Tuesday with the CG Immigration Service in my office. And those officers, as I speak, they are 
having their punishment. You cannot disrespect Nigerians or foreigners just because you're wearing uniform. That era is gone. And we have said, we're introducing what we call mystery shoppers. We go to our immigration offices, our borders, our airports, and these people, we have only one responsibility, to detect bad eggs within the service. And anybody that is so detected will be treated as in an appropriate manner. I'm hoping that this will change things and uh, they because so this is it uh minister a lot of people who will never meet any government officials in nigeria and the first set of people they meet Immigration apart officers. from sometimes when the ac may not be working at the airport and the, the heat eats you when you get out of the aircraft and the immigration officials, the NDLEA, the customs and all other agencies that you meet there. And they are the very, they are the, uh, those who are carrying the image of Nigerians on their, on their faces and in their uniform. And it's important. And I'm hoping that that will work. Let's go to data aggregation and data uh, integration. Now, uh, you've mentioned NIN and a few other uh, means of identification in this country. The international passport is also one of them. But the NIMSI, the Nigerian uh, uh, Identity Management uh, uh, commission. The commission that is in charge of issuing the national identity card from the information that we have said, we, have, we understand that they've captured about 100 million Nigerians out of the over 200 million. But we do know that about 30 million ni only uh, Nigerians have their national ID. <laughs> This is far-fetched from, this is supposed to be the uh, part of the every Nigerian, what a Nigerian should have, just compared to the social security that a, a, an American or any other European will have that identifies them easily. What are you doing differently? Are there immediate plans to integrate all of these identities that Nigerians carry? Yeah, thank you. Um, for me, data harmonization is key. You can't, uh, you can't ensure economic prosperity or financial inclusiveness if you do not harmonize your data. And without proper data management, you cannot uh, progress. You can't make the sort of change that you want to make. So NIMSI, of course, is um, an agency under the Ministry of Interior. I want to tell you that we've met with the management of NIMSI. We have a work plan already sanctioned. And the first thing we want to do is harmonize all data. Uh, for me, it's not acceptable. Nigeria is arguably maybe the only country that I know of where you have a, um, a BVN, a, a BVN for the for the bank. You have VIN, Voter Identification Number for INEC. You have uh, the telcos; they have their own database. You have. Uh, uh, of course, uh, Rosie yeah, capturing their own. You have NIMC capturing their own. That's too much multiplicity, you know, and the duplication of um, proliferation. I don't want to use the word duplication. I want to use the word maybe proliferation, you know, of, uh, of uh, data capture. I think what we need to do is to harmonize all this data and make sure that we have a single repository and NIMC performs its sole responsibility. The responsibility of NIMC by law, NIMC is the only body by law, you know, that is, um, that is permitted or that is granted that privilege. I use the word privilege, you know, to, to harmonize, to be in charge of identity database in the nation. NIMC should be able to do that. So I want to assure you that we're working very closely on that. And I don't want to give you timelines now because, as I said, I don't like making promises that we can't keep. But in due course, very soon, probably in the next couple of weeks, I'll come back to we'll come back to Nigerians and be able to give definite timelines. So that takes to me to that. critical issues. Oh, um, there are cases where sometimes uh, there are attacks, and they will say those who attack they speaking alien languages that people in those communities don't even know, and they will say they are not Nigerian. So there are infiltration into our land of people of their, their identities are difficult, and those who say well, we could use some remotely controlled uh, aerial devices to detect facial uh, identities of these persons. And those, those who will say, 
even the Nigerian, uh, Nigerian people are not even so captured uh, as much as you'll be able to identify whether those who are attacking are Nigerians or not. How do you then identify the, even the identities of Nigerians? So the question is, you add an agreement with the humanitarian ministry when they came to you and they were talking about how they are able to discharge their responsibility to Nigerians in delivering uh, those uh, soccer uh, in the post-subsidy removal era. So the question is, if 30 million people have, or only 30 million have uh, collected their national ID and 100 million uh, are the people that have been captured by NIMSI, what are the plans to capture more Nigerians? Does NIMSI have the capacity to do that? Well, the technical capacity is not in doubt. NIMSI, NIMSI has, has the capacity 100%, to capture? 100%. We have the capacity and we already have a work plan which we have already submitted to the... Uh, we've already submitted it to the SGF and uh, the special advisor on uh, Eshadiza, Bala Usman in terms of the number of people annually that we want to be adding to the, to the, um, to the database. We, How much is that? NIMSI, NIMSI How many has, is that? Um, NIMSI has the, the capacity to be able to do that. And also, the era you keep talking about printed IDs, you know, the world is actually going on digital IDs. You can't take that away, you know. So the issue of, uh, of physical ID, yes, is still an option, you know, but it should be... For me, my own opinion, I'm not saying that, I'm not talking, now let me talk as Bumi Tunjiu, you're not as Minister of Interior now. I'm not speaking for government on this. I'm speaking my own personal opinion. Is that the issue of ID, of a national ID to me, in terms of the hard copy, the, 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 the physical ID, is, is something that is a bit to be optional. You know, it's not something that's mandatory, you know, but all these 100 and, um, 103 million people, you know, and embrace what we call a digital ID, you know, because the world is actually, and that's what I think we need to focus on. As much as we need to, and of course, our national ID, in my own opinion, as I said earlier, should go beyond just an ident a means of identification. Our national ID, we've, uh, we've seen it in Ghana, you know, just our, our neighbors here in Ghana. We've seen it in, um, in, in uh, UAE, United Arab Emirates. We've seen it in a couple of countries where the national ID is also a travel document. You know, it's ICAOS certified. So we have to think out of the box and not just issue IDs just for the sake of identification. If it's just for identification, there are so many means of identification. But we must look at multiple. Our, our cards can be a means of payment. I know NIMSI have tried something like that, which I think we can build upon. It has to be a means of travel. As I have said earlier, with all our smart gates and with what other countries are already, already doing. So sometimes if you are coming in, you don't even need your passport with your ID. You should be able to do that. So we are looking at features and that we can integrate into the solution and produce, a, if we want to produce a physical ID, let it be a physical ID that Nigerians will be able to get value, you know, for. It's not just a matter of who are you, I'm this, or oh, this is my ID. It's not about that. The world has gone beyond that. My, Sheon, this is 2023. This is not 2003. And we have to be able to, to compare. We have to be able to benchmark whatever service we are delivering to Nigerians as against what is delivered by similar agencies or ministries outside of Nigeria. We should be talking about international best standard. And I think that is what the Renewed Hope is about. Renewed Hope is not about doing the same thing the same way. Renewed Hope is about doing things, you know, uh, in, in, in a more enhanced way that will be able to um, give Nigeria a bit of suko and right. um, excitement. Let me take you to the, um, the prisons as very popularly, the correctional services. Uh, it said about over 70% of inmates are waiting trial. The last time you were on this program, yeah. you said you were going to be speaking with other sister ministries to ensure uh, that there will be proper administration of the space justice. and the criminal justice system. What have you done so far? Well, what we've done, like, as I said, I'm a man that I deal with figures, I deal with data. You understand, I plan. And what we've done is that we've looked at our whole, uh, the role, you know, and... Uh, we discovered that over 4,000 of these people, of the inmates, are uh, uh, in 
due to their inability to pay fines, you know, so we have been able to separate that, you know, so, and we are already working with some PSOs, some agencies, some companies as a matter of CSR to be able to see how we we'll sort that out. So we're already working on that, at least be able to get these 4,000 people out of correctional service and give. What percentage are these 4,000 in the entire number of inmates? Well, 4,000 out of 80,000, we have about 70 something thousand, uh, if my mathematics. In federal is, prisons? No, prisons across. So, uh, in all of the prisons in Nigeria? Yes, yes. we have about 4,000. And, and I want to also tell you that most of our inmates, about more than 80% of them, are state offenders. Not federal offender, so that means they have to, we have to collaborate with the state governments, you know, to be able to because it's prisons. I mean, correctional service is on the concurrent list. It's not an exclusive. Uh, it's not on the exclusive list. So we are already uh, there's a committee that will set up to be able to look into this, and I can assure you that we will come up with uh, with verifiable steps and um, an action plan in due course. But at least once we get this out again, let's not forget. I spoke the last time about non-custodial services. Centers, yes, yes centers, I spoke yeah. about that because the difference between one of the major differences that we have between the prison service and the correctional service is the introduction of non-custodial centers. You know, so this is an this is something we're already working on. We have done our homework as a ministry, and we will take it up to the appropriate level. You know, government is their processes. You know, mm -hmm. we'll take it up such that because from our own anticipation and from our own estimation. If we are able to introduce the non-custodial services, we should be able to further decongest our prisons, our correctional centers, rather, by 43%. So that brings our, the number of inmates that we'll have to about 42,000. You know, that brings it down a, a bit more, and it, avoid, it helps us to solve the problem right. of uh, congestion and overcrowding of our correctional centers. We still do not know what has happened in the Kuje attack. Do we know? Well, uh, these are national security issues with gross implications on our collective security. So these are not issues I'll be able to discuss on camera. But I tell you, government is on top of it. And uh, government will have it under control. But, um, How much of the repairs of the infrastructure or the rebuilding of the infrastructure, you see some of the prisons, they look like they've been built Some of the, the correctional years. centers. Some of the correctional uh, centers. Yes. Yes, we are, we, are, we are putting a lot into that in terms of our plans, but I will not sit here and tell you vulnerabilities, you know. No, no. Of, so we just uh, want to know, this, uh, because if you see them, you know that these are vulnerable structures. Don't worry. And sure. that's why some the of these attacks thing, the only, would happen the in only, minutes. The, only thing, and they're, they're, the, the only thing I can assure you and assure Nigerians is that we're putting in everything to make sure that these correctional centers are actually corrective in nature and are not condemnation centers. Personally, I'm passionate about this. And I can tell you that the president is very passionate about this. The people, the inmates, a lot of them are very vulnerable. And we need these places to be a place of hope, where people can rebuild hope, where people can rebuild life, and where people can come out as better people, better individuals. We are committed to that. And also, we are also committed to the reintegration plan, even post uh, uh, correctional service life giving them succor and giving them hope and giving them skills and what they need to survive. So, but in terms of the architecture, in terms of the security, in terms of vulnerabilities, I'm so sorry to disappoint you. <laughs> it's not what I can talk about here. All right. I have two quick questions and we have two minutes. I don't know how you want to do it, yeah. but the first one being uh, the NSCDC. Their major mandate is to protect national assets. Critical national assets. Oil theft is being on the rise. Is the NSCDC still relevant, yeah. considering the, their mandate and what is happening? They are more relevant now than ever. <laughs> and like, but, but are they doing what they are yeah, supposed the, to be doing? The, the NSCDC is doing a great job. But you have to understand, when you look at the NSCDC Act, you will understand the enormous, the humongous responsibility that they have. Critical national assets, uh, I mean, protection of our oil asset, our mining sites, even churches, even schools, even public offices, and a lot. There's a lot that they are doing, and um, we are trying to increase the number of people, get the num increase the number of hands, and also em enhance their training while also uh, giving them um, equipments, you know, that's, uh, that's needed. But I can tell you there are some reforms that we're also putting in place. 
Do you think they, they could be met with the Nigerian police? No, this? I don't think so. I Since think... we are under police? No, no, I don't think so. I don't think so. The responsibilities are different. There are those who believe that it could be a department under no, the Nigerian police? they are the service. Coastal Guard. Of, I mean, they are the National Guard of Nigeria. In America, you do... The equivalent of the National, the National Guard. Guard. That's do. exactly, yes. They have their own key responsibility. And it will be a, a disservice to those men. I mean, if I come here and undervalue the efforts that they are doing. But oh, we just want to get the assurance that they are, get, they are doing they're, what, they're, they're, what the Constitution they or are the law do, they're says. Doing, they, they are doing a lot, and they are bringing a table to the security architecture All right. of Nigeria. The final question, just in about 30 or 40 seconds, is the porous borders of Nigeria. The immigration service is under your purview. What are you doing uh, differently, to digitally perhaps monitor the very millions of kilometers of Nigerian borders. Well, we have uh, we don't have millions of kilometers of border. We are not we are not as big as that. We are not as big as which country is <laughs> in uh, Canada or in Africa? Yeah. Yeah. So, but um, Nigerian border is just over four thousand kilometers, mm -hmm. and um, land border is about four thousand kilometers. And of course, we border four countries. We border uh, Cameroon down south, we border Niger, we border Chad, and of course, we border Benin Republic. So we are doing a lot uh, in terms of border control management. That's what I spoke about earlier today. And we're looking at so many illegal routes, and uh, there's a lot of um, technological enhancement. Also, let me say this, though we don't have time. We have, uh, we're putting in a lot of effort into our border communities, and that is why today the border community Development Agency is now under the Ministry of Interior. We have a lot of work to do in developing our border communities because some of our border communities are not just border communities, they are contagious communities. Contagious communities in the sense that in so many cases they are half Nigerian, half the other part. So there's a lot of uh, work for us to do to enhance patriotism on that side. Technology alone cannot help, cannot solve the problem of our borders. We need the support of Nigerians. We need the support of those border communities. And we need to get their support. We need to enhance cooperation. The former CDS them. says about 137 of our borders are unguarded. It, it, that's what I'm saying. It goes even beyond the unguarded borders. Mm. The most important thing is the support right. of these inhabitants, of Nigerians in this border community. Right. But for, us to, for them to be able to give us that level of support, we must also show more effort in terms of development sure. of those communities. Minister for Interior, Honorable Olubumi Tunjojo, thank you so much indeed. You've made some statement tonight. Nigerians will be holding you and holding you accountable. I'm looking forward to the performance. But thank you so you much know, just like President Bola met Tinobu, the president, we do not make promises we can't keep. Thank you so much indeed. Thank you. That's our show for tonight. I'll see you tomorrow again. I'm Sean Kimale. Bye-bye.